Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Daniel Lebrero, and we are here today to talk about stability patterns. Very briefly about myself, I have been working on the JVM for 17 years. I have built all kind of systems from embedded applications to big data, and right now I'm working as a technical architect for IG. IG is the world leader on CFD and spread betting. It's part of the FTSE 250, and it has development centers in London, Krakow, and Bangalore. So let's talk about stability patterns. What are they? In the released book, Michael Nygaard um, presents eight patterns that are going to help us to keep our applications up and running for longer, even in the presence of failure. And one of the key lessons from the book is that failure is ine inevitable. So our systems need to know how to cope with failure. And of course, coping with failure, it doesn't mean that we provide the same level of service. It can very well mean that we degrade uh, to be able to accommodate that failure. So show of hands, how many people have read the book? Okay, not enough. So I would recommend everybody that once this session finishes, you should go and not buy this book. You should actually wait and pre-order the second edition that it should, go, um, it should be live on, on October. And look at the fancy jet, that's how you know you are on the second edition. So what we are going to do in this session is we are going to go through each of the patterns and see how we apply them into one of IG's applications. So the application that we are going to talk about, it's called Market Analysis. It's, it's a website. And what the application provides is a bunch of information for our clients to be able to make uh, more informed decisions before they place a, a trade. To be able to, do, to draw that page, Market Analysis, first you need to talk with SSO to know if the user is logged in or not, and to know which user is that. Then we have to talk with user preference service because the client can choose which modules he can see. Then that header comes from our CMS system and some of the news and analysis articles come also from the CMS. That piece of information comes from something called market taxonomy. That comes from client information, that comes from the dealing API, and so and so and so. So to be able to build this page, market analysis needs to talk with 13 different backends. And also, not for this particular page, but on other pages, we also have to talk with addi additional services. So why I'm talking about dependencies? Because integration points are the number one killer of systems. When we build market analysis, we keep two key principles in mind. The first one is that all data should appear when the page loads. And this is because the US guys, they said that it was a very bad user experience if you uh, load a page and you see a lot of spinning uh, GIFs. And the second one is because the SEO team wanted to have as much data, as much information available on load for Google to, to see it. And the second principle, because failure is inevitable, is that no service should be essential. What does this mean? It means that if all those services, marketing red, they were unavailable or they were down, we should still be able to show something to the client, which will be a little bit crappy that, like that, but at least we are able to show something. Um, this is the very high level, very simplified architecture of market analysis. So we have a set of load balancers that will forward the request to one of the market analysis instances. And the market analysis, what it will do is will contact a set of internal services to collect the data. And some of those internal services, they will need to go to a third party to get uh, the data. If we look at the life cycle of one of the market analysis requests, what we do is that um, we parallelize the work needed for each of those different modules. Yep. So the main thread, the Tomcat thread, it will create a bunch of tasks that it will run in parallel. And once the tasks have been finished, what we will do is collect everything and send that response to the client. And notice that for some of those modules, it's not just a simple proxy. It actually has to connect to more than one backend service. So let's start to talk about um, the patterns. So the premise behind the timeout pattern is very simple. is that you never want to wait forever for an operation to, to complete. So any time that a thread is going to do any kind of blocking I.O., you need to make sure that you allocate uh, an amount of time for that operation to complete. First, because failure is inevitable, it means that you don't want to have a threat there waiting for something that is never, ever going to happen. Second, because failure is inevitable, you have to, uh, your code has to make sure that it actually um, handles that timeout exception that is going to happen at some point. 
So where do we apply this timeout pattern? In the first place that we uh, apply it is when we parallelize the work. So when the Tomcat, th the Tomcat thread comes and it parallelizes the work, what it's going to do is going to wait an, an a fixed amount of time for those tasks to complete. If the tasks are very fast, the Tomcat thread will just finish as soon as, as, as the task has finished. But if any of the tasks take longer than that time that we have allocated, what, what, what we will do is we cancel an unfinished task and we collect as much data as we can and we'll send it to the client. Second place where we apply timeouts is whenever we make an HTTP call. So most of the code, we use the Apache HTTP client. And for the Apache HTTP client, you always have to configure those uh, three timeouts. The connection pool is how long are you willing to wait for a connection to be available in the pool. The second timeout, the connection timeout, it's how long are you willing to wait for the socket to be open uh, to, that, to the server. And the second timeout, it's how long are you willing to wait for the, that server to return you some data. So if you configure, your, your, your timeouts with that, one second, one second, and one second. What do you guys think is the worst case scenario? How long a thread can be blocked in the worst case? So if for whatever reason, the server you are connecting to, it behaves like this. So if it actually sends just uh, one byte every 500 milliseconds, what will happen is that the socket timeout every time that receives one of those bytes, it will reset. So it will start to count from scratch. So in theory, um, the request can take several minutes to complete. And of course, this is not going to happen to you, but in case you want to protect yourself against this, uh, you have two options. One is you have to manually uh, cancel, interrupt the thread that is blocked on the IO, or if you are using uh, HTTP client 4.3, it comes with a future request something something, um, that it, it, what it will do is will wrap uh, the HTTP calls in a future so you can cancel if you no longer need that HTTP uh, call to finish. In other places, we are using the Async HTTP client. The first bit difference between the Async HTTP client and the Apache HTTP client is that Async HTTP client doesn't have a connection timeout, a connection pull timeout. This doesn't mean that it doesn't have a connection pool. It just means that they have decided that there is no point of actually waiting for a connection to be available. So if the connection is there, great. If not, you just get an exception straight away. Now, in the case of the HTTP, async HTTP client, you still, if you have that configuration, you still have the same problem, that um, the request can take too long. But in the case of that sync HTTP client, it comes with another timeout, the request timeout, that will do what you will expect. So if you set a request timeout of three seconds, the request will never ever take more than those three seconds. Other places that you need to uh, set up timeouts is whenever you connect your, your database, be it an SQL or non-SQL, you should usually look for those three at the typical timeouts that you need to look for. And the last place where you need to apply timeouts is whenever you do any kind of locking or any time uh, that you have a, a queue. So always, always use the time version of the APIs. Second, uh, the second uh, pattern is the circuit breaker. Probably this is a more famous one. Um, the idea is very simple. If you know that an operation that you are about to perform is going to fail, then it's actually better not even try to run to execute that, uh, that operation. And more if detecting a failure is going to take some time. So the way circuit breakers work is that you wrap your operation, the dangerous operation, in a circuit breaker, and the circuit breaker is just a state a machine that starts with a closed state. In the closed state, uh, the circuit breaker is going to always execute that operation. And what it's going to do is going to keep track of how many times that operation failed. Once it detects that that operation has failed just too many times, it will go to the open state. On the open state, uh, the circuit breaker doesn't bother to run that operation. What it will do, it's usually just throw an exception straight away. Uh, every amount of time, depending on your configuration, the circuit breaker will move to a half open state. On the half open state, what we are doing is we are trying to see if that operation is again safe to be executed. If we find out that it's not safe, we'll go back to the open state and we wait again those, that time before we go uh, to try it. If everything works, it will go through the closed state and will run the operation all the time. 
The way you detect too many errors, what too many errors uh, means, it depends on the library that you are using. It can be as simple as just counting the number of consecutive requests that fail, or it can be as complex as uh, uh, checking the percentile of operations that fail on a uh, rolling time window. The way we use circuit breakers is we use them around any HTTP call that we make. Yeah, so this way we protect market analysis against any uh, service that is being slow. Uh, we have one circuit breaker for each of those internal services that we talk to, and we have found that that's, at least in our case, is used to coarse grain, because a, a service can have two endpoints, and those endpoints can have completely different performance and resilient characteristics. Or you can argue that our services are not micro enough. When a circuit breaker opens, what we do is we usually wait between 15 minutes and one hour for, uh, before we raise an alert, because we um, integrate with some third parties that are really crappy, so we expect sometimes for them to be down. And the most famous library is uh, Netflix history. The bullhead pattern. So the bullhead pattern says that because failure is inevitable, you should always be prepared to handle that, that failure, and you should try to limit the amount of damage that that failure can cause. Uh, the idea comes from ships, so ships are divided in compartments. So if there is any hull damage, just one of the compartments will be flooded, and the other ones will not. So this ship will stay afloat. Um, how we use this pattern? So in the very, very small, we have one HTTP client, one instance of HTTP client, that is different for each of the, the services that we connect to. That way, what we are doing is protecting the service uh, the connection, the, the, the data, from uh, any of the services going back. So what we are doing basically is separating each of the connection pools uh, to those backend services. At the very large, we have decided to divide the clients into two groups, live clients and demo clients. That way, if something happens, if something bad happens in one of the data centers, the other gr uh, group of clients will not be affected. And on the medium, when we started moving all of our services to, uh, to Linux, to Tomcat, what we did at the beginning was running more than one application on the Tomcat with the idea that we wanted to save the overhead of having more than one JVM. Now, when we put this thing into production very quickly, we found that, for example, an application, application number two, having a memory leak, it will also affect application one and application three. So what we decided to do, it's apply the circuit breaker, uh, sorry, the bulkhead pattern. So we'll just run one application in each Tomcat. This way, what we are doing is we are uh, sure that um, we are isolating the memory usage, class path, path, class path issues, database connections, and Tomcat threads, we are uh, isolating those. Now, because we are still running everything in, in the same Linux box, we are still sharing CPU and IO resources, which can cause some issues. Another pattern. The steady state pattern, it says that for each mechanism that you have that allocates resources, there should be another mechanism that um, recycles those resources at the same or a faster pace, because no resource is infinite. Just think about garbage collection, right? If you are allocating too many objects and the GC is not able to keep up with that allocation, you will end up with some kind of memory error. So uh, from the book, some examples, log rotation, so um, these uh, hard disks, are, they don't have an infinite size. The second one that usually causes trouble is that you have to make sure that you size your caches correctly it's because you don't have infinite memory. Connection pools, so check that you have a maximum amount of, of connections. And data archiving and purging, so you want to make sure that your uh, database uh, queries are snappy. And for example, whenever you have any pagination in your APIs, you are actually applying this pattern because what you are doing is you are, um, you are constraining how much data, how much uh, memory you need to process those requests. Now I want to focus on thread pools because um, when I do interviews to senior developers, my, one of my favorite questions is if you have a thread pool in your application, how um, and you wanted that thread pool to be production ready, what do you need to configure in that thread pool? What are the configuration parameters that you have to set? So it seems that everybody knows that you have to um, specify the maximum number of threads 
and some people know that they can specify a minimum uh, number of threads that they will be ready for you for there to, to run the, the work. And some people know about the idle timeout. But what I'm really looking for is that every time that you create a thread pool, it comes with a working queue. And if you don't configure it, it will come with an unbounded working queue. An unbounded working queue means that you need an unbounded amount of memory uh, for that queue. And that's something that we don't have. So whenever you create a thread pool, you need to th specify, you need to constrain how many tasks, how many memory you want to go to give to that working queue. Now, because we have constraint, the amount of tasks, it means that because things are going to fail, at some point, that queue is going to become full. So the second thing that you need to specify is the rejection policy. So what do you want? How do you want to uh, behave if that, uh, if that queue becomes full? So in the case of Java, it comes with four rejection policies. Abort, which means that if I try to put uh, an item, a task, in the working queue, and the working queue is full, you should just throw an exception. This is the one that we use because we want to have an alert if that thing happens. Color runs, it means that the, the thread that is trying to put into the queue will run the task itself, and this is useful uh, for some kind of back pressure. And then you have discard, so just um, silently ignore the, the work or discard all this if the oldest uh, tasks are, are less uh, valuable. Fail fast pattern. If the thick we break a pattern, it's the client, the, the one that tries to guess if the server is going to be able to fulfill the request given its historical behavior. On the fail fast pattern, it's the server itself, the one that before doing any kind of work, it tries to guess if it's going to be able to to fulfill the request. And the idea here is that if you know that you are going to fail, it's, it's better to do it as soon as possible instead of going halfway through the, through the request, using all the time and resources just to find out that uh, you, you have a problem. Uh, Michael Nygaard uh, um, give us this, uh, um, give, explains, oh, sorry, he give us this option. So for example, you should check your SLA or you should check what's the state of the circuit breakers, or what is the, uh, you should try to get connections from the pool. So you should check, um, try to be prepared uh, uh, to know if you are going to, to be able to fulfill that request. Now, of all those things, we actually just do a little bit of the last one, because we have uh, all this parallelization, and it's quite dynamic about which modules we can load for a given user. We didn't find an easy way to actually uh, implement this pattern. So basically, we're not implementing it. Another pattern, handshaking, it just means that the client should check first with the server to know if the server is ready to, to, to run the query. Uh, some examples of how you will use it is whenever you get a connection from the connection pool, for example, you will do a really cheap query to know that the, that the socket is open and that the database is ready, or whenever you do some kind of hard bidding. As an example, uh, market analysis is actually fronted by Varnish. Uh, Varnish is an HTTP proxy cache, and you can configure it to, uh, on a background thread to check, uh, to hit a health, health check endpoint on market analysis so that when a client comes, it will check if market analysis is ready. If it's ready, you will, you will just forward the request to market analysis. But if market analysis is not ready, it will return just the cache result that, uh, from the last operation, or it will return an error if it doesn't have anything on the cache. Test harness. So the idea is, again, very simple. You should be really, really able. You should re be really, really mean when you test your services. So one thing is that you test for errors, but what Michael Nygaard tell us is that you should really think outside the box. And, um, and some examples, for example, is if you connect with an HTTP service, you should test what happens if the SAT server accepts a connection, but it never uh, sends any data back. Or what happens if that server just sends one byte per second. The way we implement this is that in our regular build, we will have, we'll use the Maven cargo plugin to start a Tomcat with the application up and running. And then from the test, we'll start a jetty, an embedded jetty, with one of those evil, evil servlets. Then from the test, we will hit market analysis through the HTTP interface, so through the external interface, and we will configure market analysis to hit that evil servlet. And we will test things like uh, that the circuit breakers work, that we have 
uh, the bullheads, each, each HCP client is properly configured. Doing this, oh, there's an example of an evil, one of the evil HCP servlets. Now, uh, on the newer projects, instead of writing the servlets by hand, uh, if you use Wiremock, Wiremock comes with uh, some of these capabilities out of the box, so you don't need to do it yourself. Uh, with this kind of testing, um, you can test a lot of this stuff, but not everything. So in the newer projects, what we are doing is that we are actually using Docker to do our resilient testing. In the case of using Docker, uh, the way it works is that you will start your, your system, which can be just one box or several boxes, a database, whatever you need, and then we will also run a toxy proxy. A toxy proxy comes from Shopify, and it's a TCP proxy where you can go and inject faults. Yep, so you can delay uh, packages or you can uh, drop connections, things like that. Because it's a TCP proxy, what we will do is you will put it between your application and your database or your HTTP dependencies. You can put it in anything that talks TCP. And then we'll do the same. From the test, we'll hit the external interface and we'll see how the system behaves. With this kind of testing, um, we can, you know, you can test all the, all the um, possible, um, all the things that Michael Nygaard suggest, but you also can test a lot more with a little bit of extra effort. Uh, there is a project called Archelian CubeQ that is a DSL to be able to configure that toxic proxy. So I would recommend you guys to check it. Last pattern, the coupling middleware. So uh, on the book, Michael Nagar just talks basically about GMS, yeah? So you want, you never, if you can avoid it, you don't want a request response. What you want, it's some asynchronous uh, uh, communication, because when you go asynchronous, it means that you are decoupling your producer from your consumer, which is great. But in our case, we just have a web application. So we thought like, well, what are we going to do? Are we going to send HTTP requests through GMS and then put some correlation on D and then wait back for that thing? So we thought that this, this pattern didn't apply to us. But if we think about it, when a client makes a request, that request goes to MA, market analysis, then market analysis forwards it, forwards it to one of the internal services, for example, news, and then news goes and talks with a third party, which means that during all that time, we have a thread block, and the amount of time that the thread block, it depends completely on a third party. So it's completely out of our control. So in the first version of all these internal services, we follow more or less this pattern. We'll put a cache with some time to live, with the hope that whenever the user make a request, we will hit the cache. So when we put this thing into production, actually it, it worked. Most of the time, we will have a really uh, fast uh, response time, but for a very long tail of clients, we will hit the worst case because either the item was not on the cache or because the time to live of the item has expired and we need to go and get a fresh item from the third party. So on the second version of all those internal services, we changed the way we did the integrations. The way we will do it is we'll have some kind of background task in each of the uh, internal services that it will go to the third party, it will get the data from the third party and we'll put it in some kind of local storage. So that, oops, so that when a request came from the user, we will always hit the local storage. So we are decoupling the request from the user from any kind of third party communication. Local storage can be something as simple as a hash map, or can be an elastic search cluster or some database. The problem with this pattern is that the third party provides some API with some functionality. You have to duplicate that functionality in your local storage. But we like this pattern so much that we actually implement it in market analysis itself. So we look at market analysis and we say like, well, what are the critical things, the minimum stuff that we actually need for market analysis to be able to draw a page? So for example, one of the things that we really, really need is that header on the top header from the CMS. So we just create a background thread that will go and when the CMS fails, it will just get everything from, from the local cache. So we'll have a local copy always. Um, there was one particular um, third party that we couldn't use this pattern because they had so much data and they have such a crappy API that we couldn't actually get all that information and put it into some local storage. So for this particular API, what we did is that when the request came to the cache, 
what we will do if it's the item was not in the cache, we will put the work, we will put the task to go and fetch the data into some queue. And we will immediately return to the front end. We'll tell the front end, oh, can you please come back in 10 seconds? And the hope or the idea was that uh, we will have time on those 10 seconds to actually uh, go to the third party and, and, and put the element on the cache. And yeah, when the client came, the data was there. And notice that the guy that will do the waiting won't be a market analysis because we don't want to block the thread, but it will be actually the third party. Sorry, it will be the front end. The last, uh, part, the, the last way we implement this, this is when you use any kind of async I.O. So when a request comes to your Tomcat, there is a Tomcat thread that, uh, that is going to handle that request. So it will go and it will execute your, your code. Now it will be a point that it needs to talk with a third party, or sorry, with a, with a make the HTTP call. And traditionally what it will happen is that the thread will block until that request has finished. But if you are using a sync IO, what will happen is that the thread will go back to the Tomcat thread pool. So the request will be parked, but the thread will back to the, to the thread pool. So that thread, you can use it or it will be used for any other new incoming request. Once the request finished, there will be another thread pool, in our case, the sync HTTP uh, pool, that will continue and will finish processing that request. So if you notice, that's just the amount of time. That's the time that the thread is being used. And there, during that time, there is no thread waiting, so there is no, no uh, bl uh, thread blocking there. Um, yeah. uh, and this is why I think IO is supposed to be more scalable. It's because you don't have threads blocking for IO to happen. So um, these are all the ways and all the patterns uh, that, that we implemented. Now, you may be, may, may be wondering, well, you know, you have showed this slide like 20 times already. So, if I implement all these patterns and I follow all this, these designs, will I be able to build the unsinkable ship? Will I be able to build something that, you know, it never goes down? So, the good news is that you can actually build the unsinkable ship. But do you guys know What's the name, the other name for the unsinkable ship? I will give you a clue. It's the Titanic. And we all know how the Titanic um, ended up, right? I, oh, sorry, not that one, that one. So, you know, the Titanic was thought that it would be impossible to sink, but, you know, it just went down. And I think the, the, the important or the key lesson uh, that the Titanic show us is that failure is actually inevitable. So it doesn't matter how hard you try, you are going to have some failures. So, how many times we actually went down since we implemented, yes, since we implemented, implemented all these patterns? The first time that we actually have an outage, it was because we managed to put an infinite loop in the new service. Yeah, an infinite loop. But it was a reasonable infinite loop, I have to say. And what happens is when a user will see one particular newest item, one of the CPUs will go on fire. Now, if you have been paying attention, uh, the bullheads that we implemented, they actually don't protect about CPU. So what will happen is that the next guy that came and saw the same article, it will burn another CPU and another until we actually just, you know, nothing will work. So a failure on, on the new service, it will actually affect it, the main application. To solve this issue, um, IG is moving into a private cloud, uh, private cloud solution where we can actually specify the amount, how many CPUs we can assign at maximum to one of those services. So this should be fixed within the next year or so. The second time that we went down, um, just to remind you, that, that's the, the architecture. We're going to focus just on that one. That's bit. So when market analysis makes a request, it goes through a load balancer. And in this case, uh, it hits one of those three instances of a backend service. This is called CS client sentiment. So at some point, one of the instances, just one of the instances, it started to be really, really slow. And it actually affected market analysis. So maybe you're thinking like, well, the load balancer probably should have taken that uh, sick instance out of the pool. But the funny bit is that to be able to draw one of the market, market analysis pages, we actually had to hit client sentiment twice, two different URLs, two different points to get two different pieces of data. 
And for whatever reason, that particular instance was really, really fast on the other, um, on the other endpoint. So that's why the load balancer didn't take it out. Now, we have already implemented uh, circuit breakers. So you should like, well, what happened with your circuit breakers? If I look at the status of the circuit breakers during this time, it will look more or less like this. The first page that we load, it will be like, oh, this is happening, like, hmm, something is going wrong here. But then the next time, it will hit another two instances, and we'll be happy. And another two instances, I will be happy. And it will go back again to the same state. So you can say, like, maybe the circuit breakers were misconfigured. But that, that's a possibility. Or maybe the circuit breakers were just too coarse grain, and we should have had one circuit breaker for each of the endpoints. That's possible. Or maybe we shouldn't have a load balancer and do all the load balancing on the, on the client. That's also a possibility. But what I haven't told you is that um, the timeout that we have talking with this, that service it was actually of 20 seconds. So we have a 20 seconds timeout when talking with that service. And I can make a lot of excuses, and I can blame other people, but I think the reason for why we have a 20 seconds timeout is because we didn't believe that failure was in inevitable. To fix this one, we decided to put a timeout of 500 milliseconds, so we moved from 20 seconds to 500 milliseconds, and since then, we haven't had this issue again. So these are the two cases that I know of that where uh, we have had a complete outages in the last six years. So I think it's, it's, it's not bad. Now to wrap up, uh, some references of some of the stuff that I have um, uh, mentioned. And in summary, failure is inevitable. So please, never wait forever. Don't do it if it hurts. Contain damage. Remember that nothing is infinite. Don't waste your time. Agree before doing. Avoid waiting if you can. And please, please, please be able. Thank you very much. <laughs>